So good afternoon and welcome. Thank you for taking the time to join us for this special research update. Gathered for the live presentation today are members of the Hearing Health Foundation Board of Directors, staff, and some of the Hearing Restoration Project consortium scientists who were kind enough to step away from their microscopes to join us today. We have people with a range of knowledge of hearing loss research listening in. For some of you, this is an introduction. Others have heard a little bit about HRP from a colleague, friend, or loved one and are participating today to learn more. Some of you have a deeper level of understanding of our research and are looking for an update on hair cell regeneration, the HRP progress made to date, and where we're heading in the months ahead. No matter who you are, we all have one thing in common, a personal connection to hearing loss. Maybe you or a loved one was born with a genetic hearing loss or developed hearing loss over time due to loud noise or even instantly from a traumatic event. And some of you have hearing loss or know someone who does because it happens to us as we get older. We want everyone to obtain new knowledge and information today so Dr. Bar Gillespie will cover a lot of ground over the next 30 to 40 minutes. Some of the scientific terms, visuals, and materials presented to you may be unclear. Dr. Bar Gillespie will provide definitions as he speaks, but please write down whatever questions you might have and just assume that other participants want to know the same thing and will be grateful to hear the answer. There will be time for Q&A at the end of the presentation, so please, please don't be shy about asking questions. Our goal is that everyone who listens to this presentation will obtain new information on hearing loss and our research toward a cure. And it doesn't end today. If, after listening to the briefing, time passes and you have questions or thoughts, we are your source for reliable, accurate, up-to-date information. We intend to hold many more of these special research updates with our researchers in the future. There will be plenty of opportunities for learning as we go forward. Thank you again for your time and interest in our hearing restoration project. I want to just take a, a moment or two to give a brief bit of history of Hearing Health Foundation in case you're unaware. Hearing Health Foundation was founded in 1958, almost 60 years ago and we've established a reputation for pioneering breakthroughs in hearing and balance research. Some examples of this were we were early supporters of the revolutionary cochlear implant, and today 220,000, over 220,000 children and now adults are benefiting. We advocated for the passage of the universal newborn hearing screening legislation in the 90s, and today 97% of newborns are tested for hearing loss at birth. Throughout our history, our Emerging Research Grants program has and continues to provide seed funding for early stage scientists in hearing imbalance science, leading to discoveries in hair cell regeneration, tinnitus, hyperacusis, and Meniere's, to name a few. Many of these researchers have had fruitful careers and gone on to obtain federal funding for their work, and this is one of the measures of success. Our experience th throughout the year years leads us to our focus today a biologic cure for hearing loss and tinnitus through hair cell regeneration, our hearing restoration project. And now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Bar Gillespie, our HRP director and professor at Oregon Health and Science University. Peter, take it away. Claire, um, hello and good afternoon to everybody. I'm going to mute everybody right now. The content okay. is in lecture mode. So. Uh, I want to tell you today about the, the Hearing Restoration Project, um, both the motivation behind it, uh, the, the approaches that we're taking, um, and the progress we've made to date. Um, and, and I hope that uh, I'll give you some new information that gets you excited about uh, where we're going with this, this program. First, though, I want to give you a little bit of background on the ear, just so that we're all on the same page. Um, I think most of you know about the external ear here, and probably most of you know that the, the cells that are actually responsive to sound, the so-called hair cells, live in the internal ear here. Um, and in fact, uh, the, the, the internal ear is made up of two divisions, the vestibular system, which I might talk about in a moment, and that's used to give your sense of position of your head in space 
but also the auditory system, uh, which is responsible for detecting sound. Now, I, I'd like to just give you a sense of where these hair cells are, but don't worry about remembering all the details. It took me a couple of years to, to really understand the anatomy of the organ, but I think it's still useful to, to go through. Here's a, a cruder view of the, of the uh, uh, ear on the, on the left. And if you take a cross section through the part of the inner ear that's responsible for, for detecting sound, the cochlea, you see a complex uh, system here of multiple chambers. But the key thing are these red guys here, the so-called hair cells. Um, they're the sensory cells that, that respond to sound. And they're also the cells that are uniquely vulnerable to damage. There are other cells around the hair cells that I'll say more about later. The hair cells have a, a very specialized uh, component at their apical or their top of their, of their cell called the hair bundle. And that's the kind of antenna that, that responds to sound. Um, and I won't talk about the details of it, but just suffice it to say that we think that in noise damage that this hair bundle can be damaged and the hair cell then dies afterwards. So here's a, here's a picture of a, of a real hair cell. Um, you're actually just looking at the top of the hair cell with all of the, the, uh, the, the hair bundle on top. So the green part here is one hair cell. And you can see the, <coughs> excuse me, part of the, the, the cell that responds. The cell itself goes down deep below the, the plane of the picture here. You can also see that the cell is surrounded by other biological material. And that's the so-called supporting cells, which I'll talk about later. These are really crucial because we think supporting cells may have the capability of turning into hair cells eventually. And we know that's true in some species. So I've already told you that, that hair cells are destroyed by noise. And this just gives an example. These are from, from a cochlea. These white things here, these V-shaped structures, are the hair bundles of the cochlear hair cells. And you can see after noise that, that many of them are missing completely, and the hair cells actually have died. Likewise, uh, other treatments, other conditions that lead to loss of hearing, like uh, some types of antibiotics, some types of cancer chemotherapeutic uh, agents, and even just aging, um, leads similarly to the loss of the hair cells. So losing hair cells means you lose your hearing, and we'd like to get them back. So in the past century, uh, the primary treatment for, for hearing loss has been hearing aids and cochlear implants. Um, and, and these have been very successful, but certainly are imperfect. I think for this century that we've got a, a number of different thrusts into getting much more effective therapy. First of all, and foremost, I would say, is prevention of hair cell loss. Um, uh, preventing the, the damage to the hair cells in the first place is one of the best things you can do to pre preserve your hearing. And we need to continue to tell that to young people in particular. There are uh, approaches going on for gene therapy, particularly for people who've lost hearing due to genetic disorders. Um, but by and large, the, the bulk of people who've lost um, hearing have, have done so through noise damage or aging, and they might be candidates for turning the hair cells back on, restoring the hair cells, re regenerating the hair cells. And that's the focus of the Hearing Restoration Project. So the Hearing Restoration Project was, was founded just a few years ago. Uh, and it's the first and, and, to my knowledge, only consortium that's focused on, on hair cell regeneration. There, there are 14 different investigators, um, plus myself, the scientific director. And one of the key things, and I'm going to come back to this a couple of times, one of the key things about the consortium is that we are a collaborative group. We share our data. Uh, not just the data that are funded by the Hearing Restoration Project, but other data as well. And even more importantly, uh, we share our ideas. So the ideas that, that 
one lab has might stimulate some really exciting research in another another lab. And the fact that we can get together and discuss these ideas is, is truly stimulating. But the HRP can also fund projects that don't uh, necessarily fit into the to the the goals of the NIH, and and we think that there's some some types of projects that aren't funded by the NIH that really are essential for understanding hair cell regeneration, and so that's been a, a really um, valuable <coughs> role for the Hearing Restoration Project. Finally, I, I just want to point out uh, that we have a scientific advisory board consisting of a number of different scientists from across the, the, the country. And the scientific advisory board gives us oversight, gives the HRP you know, sort of a check. Um, they evaluate our proposals, and they give us guidance as to directions in which to go. So this slide I'm not going to belabor, but I just want to point out that there are you know, 15 of us in the HRP from across the United States and, in fact, international. There's a, uh, um, one member from Canada and one member from uh, Great Britain. Um, and so uh, we brought together the, the best of the auditory field uh, in, in order to you know, bring our minds together and, and be able to do things that we can't do on our own. So one of the, the key facets of the hearing restoration project's approach is that we use three different animal models for studying hair cell regeneration. And we do that for, for a couple of interesting reasons. First of all, two of those models, the chick, as you see here on the left, and the zebrafish, as you see here on, on the right, they show robust hair cell regeneration. So if you damage the hair cells of a chick or of a fish, then within uh, a short time, only a day or two for the fish and, and uh, a few days to a few weeks for the, for the chick, uh, the hair cells are, uh, uh, come back. New hair cells are formed. So that's really spectacular because it tells us that, that animals are capable of re uh, regenerating hair cells. By contrast, the mouse is our other experimental model, and it, and it serves a similar role. Um, uh, it, it serves, stands in for people. So the mouse shows no hair cell regeneration um, after a few days after birth. You can, you can damage the hair cells in the mouse, and as far as we can tell, um, nothing much happens in terms of restoring uh, hair cells. And so we can figure out how to, to regenerate hair cells in the mouse then I think we can figure out how to regenerate hair cells in people. So let's look a little more uh, in detail at, at the, the inner ear, because there's a couple of features here that will give you an idea of what, how we're trying to go about this, this project. So I mentioned supporting cells. So here you can see both hair cells in red and supporting cells in yellow. And the supporting cells surround the hair cells. They Form a, play a structural role, as their name would seem to indicate. Um, and you can see they're not homogeneous. There are, are different types of hair cells that do different things in the ear. <clears throat> so we know from um, experiments that have been done in the past that what happens when fish and chick have damage to their hair cells is that it's the supporting cells that give rise to new hair cells. Either a supporting cell can turn directly into a hair cell, uh, or it can divide um, and make one hair cell and, and the other cell would remain a supporting cell. However, in the mouse, that doesn't seem to be the case. Supporting cells don't convert to hair cells after the, uh, the hair cells are, are damaged. So we're interested in understanding what the molecular signatures are of the supporting cells. How do supporting cells that can turn into hair cells, how do they differ from those that cannot turn into hair cells? And what are the, what are the, the, the molecular differences? Because those are, those are things that we potentially could tweak. We also want to know what happens to the supporting cells 
in the mouth after damage to the cochlea. If the whole cochlea degenerated and we were left with nothing, then it would be much more difficult to, to stimulate regeneration of hair cells. And more specifically, we, we're interested in knowing if after damage to, to the hair cells, does the, does the cochlea repair itself? So the supporting cells in their specialized uh, uh, natures remain, so the, the top panel here, or does the, the cochlea degenerate so that you have what we call a flat epithelium? Um, does that remain? And we, we think that these cells are going to be harder to turn into hair cells than these cells. So we'll get back to this in a few minutes. So the whole purpose of the HRP is to ask, starting with either this, this structure here or even this structure here, can we stimulate or inhibit regeneration pathways within the cells to make new hair cells? And when I say pathways, I mean sequences of molecular reactions that take place in the cell. There actually are hundreds or even thousands of uh, pathways that are operative simultaneously in a cell. We think that there are likely to be a few of those pathways that are important for hair cell regeneration. Maybe in the mouse there are pathways that inhibit regeneration and we need to interfere with those pathways. Or maybe there's a pathway that's active in chick and fish but is, is uh, not active in the mouse and we have to stimulate that pathway. So one way or, the other, or, or another, we want to convert uh, the supporting cells or our, uh, remaining cells into hair cells by overcoming whatever the block is to regeneration. So our strategic plan, which is developed, developed over the years by the consortium members working together, um, at, at the moment consists of three separate phases. We've made a lot of progress on phase one, and we've initiated phase two. So phase one, uh, in that phase, we do what I've told you about. Um, we compare the fish, the chick, and the mouse, see what happens to their supporting cells after hair cells are damaged, and to see if we can track down whether there are pathways that are stimulatory or inhibitory towards hair cell regeneration. And then we also want to figure out whether or not the supporting cells remain behind or we have that flat epithelium. The, the second phase is, is crucial because the experiments that come out of the first phase are not definitive. We need to validate the pathways that we've identified. We might, have had, we might get uh, you know, hundreds of leads from phase one, but we need to test those molecules and pathways in our model systems, fish, chicken, mouse, and, and figure out which of those pathways are indeed relevant for hair cell regeneration. Finally, in, in the third phase of the HRP's strategic plan, we're uh, actually going to move towards developing therapies and treatment. And the way we're going to do that is to use the model systems in the mouse that we developed for phase two and we'll screen for drugs that trigger hair cell regeneration. So let me tell you a little bit about some of the progress that we've made on phase one in particular and where we're heading shortly in phase two. So one of the most important uh, sets of experiments that we've done in the past three years is so-called genomic profiling in these three model systems in response to hair cell damage. We want to ask whether or not genes are turned on or turned off in response to that damage to, to hair cells. And we, in particular, we want to understand why the, the mouse doesn't show the same type of responses as the fish and the chick. So we've made a lot of progress with this step. We've generated large data sets from each species. We've done multiple types of experiments with each species. And then we've used a strategy, a technique called bioinformatics, which is using 
computational methods that are coupled with biological information to try and understand the relevance of the data that, that we've, we've generated. Just having large lists of genes is not terribly informative. We need to understand which of the genes are, are played together in a pathway um, and which of the genes might be relevant for uh, regeneration. And so these bioinformatics experiments are crucial for that. The other part of phase one, this should be a B right here, clearly, is to understand um, what the, the B should be right here. Uh, the, the second part is to understand the supporting cell fate. Do we get supporting cells remaining or a flat epithelium? And I, and I would say that our, our experiments look pretty good, and they suggest pretty strongly that at least in mouse, uh, even after a long, many months after damage uh, to the hair cells, the highly specialized supporting cells remain. And that is nice. It corroborates some data that have been gleaned from studying uh, uh, human ears, which suggests the same. So this is important because it suggests that we can target these supporting cells, which on a molecular level uh, are much more closely related to the hair cells than these flat epithelium cells. Phase two, as I said, we're going to be modulating the genes of interest and asking whether we can turn on regeneration in the mouse or maybe turn off regeneration in the fish and the chick. And we've got a, a variety of new projects that are starting on phase two. And I'm going to briefly talk about the projects that are, that are funded for this year in a couple of slides. So we haven't started phase three yet. Uh, we really need to to get a healthy way through phase two for two reasons. One, uh, we need to make sure that we have the ideal model system for carrying out the experiments, which are going to be uh, time consuming, expensive, and, and technically challenging. Um, and then also, we need to be sure that we know what we're targeting, um, because the phase three experiments could be much more directed if we're pretty sure we know which pathways are important. So I just want to reiterate the point about collaboration. So the, the, a lot of what we've done so far to date really has depended on the ability to, to speak together. We have an annual meeting uh, for a couple of days, and we have a, another meeting associated with the meeting that all the scientists go to. Um, moreover, we talk on the phone at least monthly and, and oftentimes much more than that. And, and this allows us to be continuously uh, 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 collaborating together, sharing ideas, uh, and it's really delightful um, from a scientist's point of view and tremendously productive. So there are simple things we can do in cl with collaboration. We can, we can not all do the same experiment because we're not talking to each other. Uh, instead, we can assign, you know, give an experiment to a different person. The collaboration also allows us to do these multi-species, multi-model experiments, um, and that really couldn't be done in, in any one lab. And that's really crucial to our approach. I think it's been very successful so far. And then finally, the collaboration allows us to see the new data months or even years before you would if it, we had to wait for it to be published. And, and the collaboration is working. You know, it's I, one measure is just to look at who comes together to propose projects to be funded by the HRP within our group. And almost all of the, the projects um, involve multiple scientists, usually from different institutions coming together to propose uh, an experimental approach. And I think it's a good test, that, uh, a good example of how this is working. So I think we have made substantial progress on this, on this first phase. <clears throat> We've uh, you know, identified a variety of candidates for these molecular triggers of hair cell regeneration and the pathways that are necessary. Well, we have too many, so we, we really are continuing to, to use bioinformatics methods to 
glean through and determine which is our most important. We have definitively shown, I think, that at least in the mouse, the specialized supporting cells remain. So we know now what our target cells are for triggering hair cell regeneration. <clears throat> We've begun the phase two research. Uh, we haven't stopped phase one, but um, but we've got multiple approaches to try and, and uh, see whether or not we can block regeneration in fish and chick or stimulate regeneration in mouse. And phase three is really, it truly is in sight, although I think there's, there's still plenty of work to be done on phase two. A few words on what projects are going on right now. And this, this first one here is a really interesting one. This project, the so-called Excel project, illustrates the value of the consortium and the collaboration amongst the consortium members. Turns out, you know, we found this out at, at one of our annual meetings, that multiple people in our consortium had seen the same phenomenon, which they each had said, hmm, that's interesting, but I'm not sure if I believe it. And the, the phenomenon was they damaged hair cells in the mouse, they waited a while, and then they, they tested for some features of hair cells, um, some molecular signatures of hair cells, and they saw them in a few cells in the cochlea. And the dogma is there aren't any cells like that. So this was a bit surprising. And, and each of them thought, well, maybe I screwed something up in my experiments. But when we got together in uh, the fall um, for our Seattle meeting, uh, the multiple uh, investigators started talking about these cells and they realized they had seen the same thing. And that gave us much more confidence that we were looking at something real. And so uh, we have, on a fast track, funded a project that, that is a collaboration with a whole bunch of labs to try and understand these so-called X cells, to understand whether they're important or not. What they seem to be telling us is that supporting cells have responded to the damage to hair cells in the mouse. They've gone part way along the pathway towards making a new hair cell, but they're, they're stuck somewhere. And we'd like to know where they're stuck because that would be a target for uh, uh, doing some sort of molecular manipulation to allow further hair cell regeneration. So, so this project is a very exciting project and it's been uh, under white way for a couple of months now. <clears throat> we have a couple of projects using the bioinformatics approach that I told you about. Now that we have this huge amount of data <clears throat> that uh, we, we have, we need to make some sense of it. And this, this is going to take quite a bit of work. We have some other discovery science type experiments because we know that we've only scratched the surface in, in discovery science. We don't really understand at a detailed level how hair cell regeneration works in those species that, that show it or how it doesn't work in the mouse. We have clues that are pointing us in the right direction towards overcoming it, but we have a lot more to learn. So these other projects, such as this Heller, Warshall, Stone, and Lovett project are looking at a vestibular organ in the chick, which also shows regeneration. Um, and this project here from Neil Siegel and Jenny Stone and Andy Groves is, is using, developing a, a, a model that, was, that uh, one of our consortium members developed that allows us to kill the hair cells very nicely. Um, and then we want to see what happens afterwards. This, this is tied in with the Excel project as well. Tatyana Piotrowski and Stefan Heller are characterizing the zebrafish in more detail because even though we know some of the steps of what's going on, we don't know all the molecular responses. And they're using really powerful techniques to understand that. Now, in phase two, we have just gotten started. We have only uh, you know, a limited uh, amount of funds to do these phase two projects. They're going to take uh, much more uh, than we have right now. But we've gotten started both on actually screening uh, the, some of the molecules and pathways, but also in developing 
tools and techniques that allow us, allow us to um, do this better in the future. So Dave Rabel and Andy Groves and Jenny Stone have a project that couples together fish and chicken mouse and asks for a gene that we can identify in, in those three species that might be playing a role in, in regeneration. Uh, what is its role in regeneration? And, and there again, comparing the different species is crucial. Stefan Heller and Albert Edge are developing a new mouse model uh, for hair cell damage that may be ideal for our, our phase three experiments as well. We'll just have to see. But in this mouse model, we'll be able to kill the hair cells uh, very cleanly. We'll be able to see what happens to the supporting cells over time. Um, and we'll be able to literally see uh, newly formed hair cells. Um, and so using this particular uh, genetically modified mouse model, we, we should be able to, to screen both candidate molecules and pathways, but also drugs um, to, to look at hair cell regeneration. Yosh Raphael is developing new ways of delivering genes in, in the mouse cochlea. And this is important uh, both for the phase two for testing, but also we may end up having to use some sort of genetic modulation of a pathway rather than a drug modulation um, for phase three. We'll see. And finally, John Vigandi um, is carrying out some additional functional testing of some key candidate molecules using a very novel uh, set of techniques. So we've, we've made a lot of progress with a relatively small amount of money. Uh, we've, we've learned a lot from phase one, and we're going to continue phase one because there are many more molecules and pathways to identify, as I've already told you. The phase two experiments that, that we're doing now are, are what we call low throughput, which means it's just they're laborious, one molecule at a time. It's going to take us a while to get through large numbers of molecules and pathways. But they're necess it's necessary to do it this way because it's really what we have right now. But our phase two must be scaled up. And this is going to be, uh, this is going to require quite a bit more investment into, uh, into the HRP. We need to be able to test many more genes. We need to be able to test combinations of different genes. Um, and we also need to develop better methods for screening genes and eventually drugs we could come up with a cell line that replicated hair cell regeneration in vitro, then we would have a much better uh, way for um, screening. A lot of people have worked on this. It's not easy to do. Um, it's going to take more work to see whether that's plausible. And as I've told you multiple times now, I think it's crucial before we turn into phase three, uh, we need to make sure that we, we have the right model uh, for, for screening drugs or genes, if that's the approach we go. So I would say that what we've learned over really the past 25 years or so is that, that hair cell regeneration is indeed a plausible way in which um, to eventually treat hearing and balance disorders. Uh, it's not going to give us um, hearing restoration next year. Um, but it will. I also want to point out that this is a wonderful time to be a scientist in some ways, because the amount of information that we have uh, about how cells operate, not just in the ear, but elsewhere in, in an organism, is extraordinary. And we're learning more and more every day. And, and very creative people are developing spectacular technologies that allow us to do experiments that we could only dream of in the past. So it's really a, a, a fantastic time to be approaching a difficult problem like this. So as the slide says, I think the question is not if we will regenerate hair cells in humans, but really when. And so I'm going to move now to the question and answer uh, phase. And I'm going to unmute the line. Um, the conference is no longer in lecture mode. And I am happy now to answer any questions that anybody has, either 
uh, sent in on the Adobe Connect or um, spoken over the phone. Thank you. Hello, this is Brian Pollard. Hi, Brian. Yes, I had a question on the dimensions of the synaptic neuron neural connections. A lot of recent work has shown that actual auditory impact may occur there, and I just wondered if your project comprehends that problem. Yeah, that's a very important point that you raise. So what I didn't talk about is what the hair cells do after they detect sound, but of course they transmit their information to the auditory nerve uh, via synapses, which are connections between the hair cells and the auditory nerve. And work primarily coming out of Charlie Lieberman's lab uh, in Boston has shown that, that noise damage that is reversible from a uh, threshold point of view, I mean, noise damage to an animal that seems to recover can lead to irreversible loss of some of those synapses. And so uh, there's, there's a recognition that, that a substantial fraction of hearing loss may be due not just to damage to hair cells per se, but maybe just to damage to the, to the synapses. So our, our project doesn't address um, restoration of those synapses directly. Um, and there are other groups I know of, of a number of, of companies that are really working hard on, on trying to come up with methods to enhance uh, synaptic um, um, connections after, after uh, damage. Um, so I, I think we're striving for a more severe type of damage. Uh, and I think the jury is still out as to whether or not um, the, the uh, most hearing loss that, that occurs amongst the American population is due to loss of hair cells or loss of, of synapses. Both are surely important. Um, but at, at the moment, we have limited resources and limited bandwidth. And so we've, we've decided to focus very much on, on causing regeneration of hair cells. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? Can I ask a question? Sure. Okay. Um, who actually um, owns the patents and rights to the final product when and if you do actually um, are able to uh, come to some uh, conclusion on this that it actually works? Yeah, that's, that's something for the future. I mean, nothing that we're doing now is, is patentable. Um, when we get to the point where we're screening um, drugs, then what we will be doing, I mean, the, the Hearing Health Foundation's interest is not necessarily in holding the patents, but rather facilitating the research to make sure that we get to a point where we have a therapy much more quickly than we would otherwise. And I think that the, the universities of the, the scientists are, are going to be interested in, in having a role. But I, but I also think that one of the things that I have not mentioned is that we anticipate as we get closer to having actual therapies or having, having drugs that we can look at that we're going to need to be partnering with industry. Um, and because they have the resources, the big resources, once a lead compound has been identified, they have the resources to move something forward. Um, so like I say, it's not the intention of the Hearing Health Foundation to, to, uh, uh, to obtain a, a, a patent, but again, just to facilitate the, the, the science and the progress towards cure and therapy. Thank you. Blair, do you want to add anything before we conclude? Yeah, I just want to make sure if anybody else has any questions, don't be shy. Um, you can type them in or you can say them out loud. Um, and, you know, I, I think just in closing, there are no other questions. 
Our goal going into today was to allow everyone to obtain new information about hearing loss, research toward a cure, our progress to date, and where we're going as we move forward. So what I would say is after listening, and while time passes, if you have questions, thoughts, things come to mind, don't, don't be afraid to contact us. Um, we are the source for reliable, accurate, up-to-date information, in particular in the area of hair cell regeneration. And uh, as I said at the start, we will be holding many more of these special research updates with our researchers. So there will be other opportunities to continue to learn as we go for and ask questions as we go forward. Just want to wait one more minute and see if anyone else has any questions. Okay, well, thank you very much for your time and participation today. We hope you got a lot out of the presentation, and we look forward to being in touch with you soon and for you to be in touch with us if you need anything from us. Thank you and have a good afternoon.